Hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back to my channel. So like me, I'm sure you've heard the conversations that have been had over the past few years as to whether today's kids are growing up too fast, whether it's how they talk, how they dress, or even the music that they listen to. And all within the past couple weeks, I've seen a lot of different pieces of content questioning whether today's teens have as many role models their age or even just age appropriate role models in general to look up to, or if they do have some, it seems like there's just way less than previous generations had. Y'all wanna know what I just thought about that low-key made me like sad is these young girls don't have no type of representation. Like they don't have girls their age, I fear, like in the mainstream to like look up to. Like as a millennial, we had Raven. We had that so Raven. We had Hannah Montana. We had Sister Sister. As a preteen, I had representation. So in today's video, we are going to discuss whether teen idols are disappearing and if they are, some of the reasons as to maybe why. And for the purpose of this video, I'll mostly be talking about teen idols in the musical sense, but I will mention other forms of media and art here and there. Simply put, a teen idol is any sort of star who has a fan base mostly made up of teens, tweens, and sometimes younger adults. This doesn't mean the teen idol has to be a teenager themselves, but they usually are, at least when their career begins. These idols can vary across cultures, of course, but some are globally considered teen idols. Some artists who have careers that last for decades can be considered teen idols during that phase of their career, but typically lose that status as they age, not always due to a decline in popularity, but because they and a large part of their fan base have aged out of it. Good examples are people like Miley or Beyonce, who definitely held that title when they were younger, but aren't considered teen idols in the present. Teen idols gained traction in the 1950s and most attribute the phrase to a 1958 issue of Life magazine. Prior to the 1950s, the concept of adolescence was acknowledged, but wasn't as widely recognized. In the 1890s, psychologist Stanley G. Hall proposed adolescence be the period between ages 15 and 24. However, by the mid-20th century, it was most widely accepted that adolescence fell in the age group between 13 and 19. Still, until 1971, the age of majority was 21, meaning that in most legal matters, anyone under that age was considered a minor. In the 50s, the post-war economic boom, developments in technology, and compulsory education helped teenagers create their own culture. They now had interests that were different from childhood, but still weren't quite the same as their parents. The abolition of child labor gave teens leisure time that several generations hadn't had before. This time was filled with music, books, television, sports, and other popular pastimes. Several teenagers spent a lot of time with their peers at and outside of school and consumed similar content to them thanks to inventions like the television and the portable phonograph, which was relatively affordable for teens. The invention of the television increased the commercial aspect of this consumption, marketing directly to teens and telling them what they should buy and enjoy in order to fit in. It quickly became evident that teenagers were a viable market with an estimated collective buying power of $9 billion in 1958. Simultaneously, pop music, a new genre at the time, was on the rise. So of course it made perfect sense for a new genre to create musical acts to market to this new teen demographic. These artists made music about experiences teens could relate to, like having crushes and feeling misunderstood by their parents. One of the most popular examples from the 1950s is Elvis Presley. Coincidentally, he's also an example of a teen idol who was never a teenager during his popularity, at least by today's standards. Elvis got his big break at age 20, but because he was still considered a minor, his father signed his initial contracts with RCA on his behalf. Almost overnight, Elvis had teen girls in his grip, making them swoon with his music and making dance moves that were parents' nightmares. Of course, this wasn't just the case in music, but also in film. Actors like James Dean and former child star Natalie Wood were also popular teen idols. Dean's most popular film, Rebel Without a Cause, depicts him as a troubled teen looking for stability and understanding. Though he was in his early 20s when he filmed the role, Natalie, who was also in it, was just 16. In 1955, Walt Disney premiered The Mickey Mouse Club, a musical variety show that aired right after American Bandstand. Logically, if this new demographic would have artists marketed directly toward them, making them visible on television was important. One of the original Mouseketeers, Annette Funicello, was also considered a teen idol and went on to both act and record music outside of Disney. In later decades, the Mickey Mouse Club was a launchpad for other popular teen idols like Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, J.C. Chazay, and Britney Spears. A popular example from the 60s were the Beatles, who were such a sensation that obsession with them became known as Beatlemania. 
Like Elvis, they took the world by storm, primarily supported by their fan base of teens and young adults. Having so many musical acts geared towards teenagers led to the rise of musical publications made specifically for them, like Tiger Beat, which was first published in 1963. By the mid-1960s, teens' buying power had increased to $14 billion. Popular examples of teen idols from the 70s included the Osmond Brothers, especially Donnie, as well as their sister Marie. The Jackson 5 were also one of the most popular acts at the time, and the first black musical act to receive teen idol status equivalent to their white counterparts. As the standout member of the group and eventually a solo act, Michael Jackson continued his status as a teen idol well into the 80s and his career in general for the next three decades until his death in 2009. The 80s to 2000s were the era where teen idols were at their peak. In the 80s, teen television shows, movies, and other media became increasingly popular. By then, teenagers had more than proved themselves a viable and loyal demographic to cater to. This was seen in the almost cult-like popularity of young actors like Alyssa Milano or River Phoenix or the group of actors dubbed the Brat Pack, which included people like Luke Perry, Molly Ringwald, and Rob Lowe. Several films at the time fell into the coming-of-age genre, in which teens had formative experiences from which they learned more about life and matured. Sitcoms and other shows regularly cover topics like peer pressure, dating, and preparation for college and career. Several of these themes carried over into music as well. Aside from Michael, other 80s teen idols included artists like Madonna and Tiffany and the boy band Menudo. Bot Magazine, another popular musical publication, released their first issue in 1983, branding itself as a magazine for anyone between the ages of 10 and teenage. In 1987, Nickelodeon aired their first Kids' Choice Awards, an awards show that primarily awarded kid and teen artists. Winners don't have to be teens or children, but must participate in a form of media popular with that demographic. Like the 80s, the 90s was a decade full of teen idols, many of whom still have successful careers. Groups like NSYNC, Destiny's Child, The Spice Girls, and The Backstreet Boys had massive teen fan bases and some of the biggest tours and pop culture moments of the decade. Solo acts like Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Usher, and Aaliyah were also highly successful thanks to the support of their mostly young fans. When his debut album came out in 1994, Usher was heavily criticized for the album containing subject matter about sex, which was deemed too mature for a 15-year-old. Of course, this didn't end his career, and he went on to become one of R&B's biggest teen heartthrobs and one of the genre's most popular male figures. Not only did these acts influence the music teens listened to, but also their fashion choices. Several of these teen idols also did acting alongside music. Artists like Brandy not only used their music to become a popular teen act, but also her starring roles in Cinderella and, of course, her show Moesha. Before she was even 19, Brandy had two hit albums to her name, aside from her acting roles. She was also one of the few teens to have their own doll modeled after her, again demonstrating how good of marketing tools these teen idols were. Not only could teen idols sell products, they could also spread messages. Several were used or simply decided to promote healthy lifestyle messages with things like anti-smoking campaigns. Several also promoted safe and responsible sex, such as TLC's Left Eye. Artists like Selena Quintanilla, who was conscious of her young fan base for her entire career, was also involved in several campaigns encouraging youth to remain in school and to stay away from drugs and gangs. In 1999, the first Teen Choice Awards aired, and that year's performers included Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Blink-182, and NSYNC. The ceremony awarded achievements in music, film, television, and sports, focusing on those popular with people ages 13 and over. In its 20-year run, the awards show had hosts including Miley Cyrus, Hilary Duff, Katy Perry, Tyler Posey, Demi Lovato, and the Jonas Brothers. The new millennium also saw a rise in teen magazines, with some coming out just before the turn of the century. In 1998, the popular teen magazine J14 was founded and marketed to youths ages 11 to 19, primarily young girls. Two years later, It Magazine was launched, which was my personal favorite from the teen magazine era. Like the other teen magazines, M focused on teen stars, especially those from Nick and Disney, alongside other popular teen acts in general. M became one of the most popular magazines in the 2000s, especially among American tween girls. A lot of these magazines also contained posters and other printed merchandise inside to entice teens to purchase them. In the late 90s, it was estimated that American kids between the ages of 12 and 17 received a combined weekly allowance of over $1 billion from their parents. Of course, teens spent a lot of this money on entertainment like concert tickets, movies, albums, and merchandise related to artists they enjoyed. From the beginning, Disney had a hand in producing several teen idols, but the company hit a gold mine in the 2000s. 
Other companies like Nickelodeon produced big stars, and some teen stars weren't associated with either network, but Disney definitely had the biggest impact on teen and tween popular music at the time. In the early half of the decade, stars like Raven Simone, Ally and AJ, The Cheetah Girls, and Hilary Duff put out a combination of successful television shows, music, and movies. The high school musical franchise was another massive success for Disney, so much so that it launched short-lived solo music careers for some of the cast. Arguably, the biggest teen idols that Disney produced in the 2000s were in the latter half of the decade. Of course, I'm talking about Miley Cyrus, Selena Gomez, Demi Lovato, and the Jonas Brothers. Though the former three started off with their own shows and movies on Disney, they also produced music through their label, Hollywood Records. The Jonas Brothers actually got their show after their fame from music, and it was nowhere near as popular, though to be fair, they got it later in the game. The typical Disney formula was to popularize a star through a movie or TV show, then use that established fan base to launch a successful music career that extended beyond the show's lifetime. In Miley's case, her role as Hannah Montana was essentially a built-in way to market her as a musical act, and she became one of the most successful in the company's history. In 2010, it was estimated that Miley, who was only 17 years old at the time, had made Disney over $1 billion across the show, tours, Hannah Montana movie, and merchandise. Demi Lovato was also a big act for Disney, starring in the Camp Rock franchise and her own show, Sunny with a Chance. While starring on Disney, Demi released and promoted her debut album, Don't Forget. Soon after, she joined the Jonas Brothers on their Burning Up tour after finishing her own warm-up tour. Selena Gomez got her star on Disney, guest starring in other shows before landing the lead role in Wizards of Waverly Place. Soon after, she became her own musical act, releasing songs with her band, The Scene. She also starred in another Cinderella story, which aired on ABC Family, one of Disney's subdivisions. Some of her music was used in the film, further marketing her as a musician and creating a slightly older fan base for her once she left Disney. Disney also promoted a lot of the songs from their acts during their commercials or premiered certain music videos during commercial breaks of their more popular shows and movies. As far as Nickelodeon goes, Ariana Grande is one of the most popular musical acts to come from the network. Though she had prior experience on Broadway, it was her role in Victorious that introduced her to several of her fans. Though she wasn't the main character, Ariana was able to showcase her singing ability on the show and turn that into an extremely successful pop career. Her impressive vocal range earned Ariana comparisons to Mariah Carey by the time she was just 20. A lot of Ariana's earlier music was romantic and bubbly, perfect for her primarily teen and young adult fan base, many of whom were experiencing love for the first time. Her image was also age appropriate for her teen fans and at times she was even criticized for appearing too young or too childish. As the decade progressed, Ariana's music matured with herself and her fan base, but still maintained themes of love, romance, and heartbreak. As I mentioned earlier, an important aspect of these teen idols is just how commercially viable they were. In the 2000s, it was almost impossible to go into any store and not see the face of some Disney or Nick idol on the face of a t-shirt or journal or school supplies. Their faces could be slapped on anything and it would sell thanks to their younger fan bases who were either fans, had crushes, or both. For this reason, it was common for these teen stars to have their own clothing lines in retail stores. Aside from the Disney Nickelodeon acts, artists like Jesse McCartney, Aaron Carter, Taylor Swift, and Rihanna all rose to stardom in the 2000s. With the rise of sites like YouTube, fans had more access to their music videos and interviews and had increased free access to their music. The birth of more post-based social media sites like Twitter and Instagram created other viable avenues through which teens could be marketed to. Fans now had more access to real-time posts and images from their favorite celebrities, and in lucky cases could communicate directly with them. The increased parasocial nature of the relationships with teen idols only increased their power and popularity. Fans could also connect with other fans and have more rapid discourse about music than fan forums had offered. A lot of this increased loyalty and support on the fans' end also led them to buying more merchandise and more products endorsed by these young stars. It was estimated in 2009 that the average teenager received about 2,000 pounds a year or about 2,400 US dollars in extra spending money. The article containing the statistic also noted the rising divorce rate increased teen buying power as several teens received money, tickets, and other similar gifts from both parents individually. In addition, due to less financial obligations, they were less affected by the recession. In the 2010s, Disney rolled out a new generation of actresses, including China Ann McClain, Dove Cameron, Debbie Ryan, Bridget Midler, and Sabrina Carpenter. All of their shows were successful, though none rivaled the success of the Disney stars from the previous generation. China Ann McClain and Bridget Midler probably came the closest at the time, especially in terms of music. 
Sabrina Carpenter and Dove Cameron are recently starting to gain traction with their music since they're no longer exclusively signed to Disney's record labels, that means they're not obligated to make their music as family friendly. Justin Bieber was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, teen idol of the 2010s. He was so big, the term Bieber mania, obviously inspired by Beatle mania, was coined to describe how big of a sensation he was. Apparently, there's a 2011 documentary of the same name that covers this. Justin's mass popularity and its effect on his fans was also referred to as Bieber fever. The Canadian Red Cross jokingly stated that Bieber fever was one of the most infectious diseases of the time and spread quicker than measles. According to them, symptoms of Bieber fever included uncontrollable crying and or screaming, excessive purchasing of memorabilia, and distraction from everyday life. The Canadian Broadcasting Channel stated that social media like YouTube and Twitter not only helped Bieber get discovered, but grew his popularity at an exponential rate. Like several male teen idols before him, Bieber was marketed as a gentle, fun-loving spirit that young girls could easily imagine as the ideal boyfriend. Many of his songs like Baby, Boyfriend, You Smile, basically all his early songs, honestly, helped to create this fantasy. Similar to a lot of stars of the Disney era, and even before that, Justin's face was slapped on several products that were sold in retail stores across the world. His tours were also extremely successful. His first, the My World Tour, brought in nearly $60 million, while his second, the Believe Tour, grossed over $200 million. It was the highest grossing tour by an artist under the age of 20. Bieber was so popular that he became a sort of archetype for the 2010s male pop star, and several labels both globally and domestically promoted artists in a similar vein to Bieber. During this time, the buying power of the teen demographic was steadily increasing. As of 2014, teens had a buying power of over $208 billion when talking specifically about products marketed to their age group. Combined, American households spent nearly $118 billion annually on entertainment, apparel, and other products for teens. As was the case with decades prior, teen musical groups were still popular in the early to mid-2010s. Groups like Mindless Behavior and OMG Girls attempted to carry the mantle of pop and R&B groups from decades prior. These groups also brought fun, colorful outfits, choreography, and needed representation for a lot of black youths who didn't necessarily see themselves in a lot of the teen idols primarily pushed by the mainstream. In the early 2010s, Mindless Behavior won several BET awards, including Best Group and Viewer's Choice, and won a Radio Disney Award for Best Group. Though the OMG girls were less commercially successful, they achieved a sort of cult-like status and influenced fashion for a lot of young black girls in that era. From a Western standpoint, the 2010s was the last decade where teen musical groups are still popular. Examples include One Direction, Fifth Harmony, and Little Mix, all of which were formed on The X Factor. One Direction was arguably the biggest boy band of the 2010s. Aside from liking the group in its entirety, several fans latched onto a specific member they were especially fond of, as is the goal with boy bands. Their debut song, What Makes You Beautiful, was about loving someone despite their flaws. Several young women took this as the band members saying they would possibly date a normal, flawed girl like themselves. And even for those who didn't genuinely believe it, it was easy to imagine. Their 2014 Where We Are tour grossed nearly $300 million, at the time making it the highest selling tour for a vocal group. Back then, it was also the 15th highest grossing tour of all time. Girl groups like Little Mix and Fifth Harmony used their music to spread messages of confidence, empowerment, and positivity. Fans of Little Mix say the group showed them what true friendship looks like and how to spread positivity. Their music also encourages self-love despite flaws and not allowing mistreatment in relationships. Several consider Little Mix to have been the biggest girl group of the 2010s, at least by Western standards. Both Little Mix and Fifth Harmony were diverse groups, meaning an array of young women could see themselves in the members. Fifth Harmony was also a multilingual group and recorded music in Spanish. They, like Little Mix, made music about female camaraderie, confidence, and knowing one's worth. Several of the members of all of these groups used their platforms to be vocal about social and political issues. A lot of them also encouraged their fans via their social media accounts and public appearances to be politically active and do things like vote. By the end of the 2010s, most of these musical groups had disbanded or gone on an indefinite hiatus. Little Mix joined them in 2022. And the popularity of Western teen groups seemed to die with them, as no groups really rose up to fill their spot. Flo, who debuted in the spring of 2022, seems like a promising group to fill the gap, but it's yet to be seen if any other groups will join them. Currently, it seems like there are less teen idols, at least in the traditional sense. The two most prominent teen idols to come from the late 2010s, early 2020s time were Billie Eilish and Olivia Rodrigo. Billie was only 14 when she rose to fame, and by 17 had released her critically acclaimed debut album. By age 18, she became the youngest artist to win Record of the Year at the Grammys. 
Billy's style was influenced by that of artists from the early 2010s like Lana Del Rey and Lord, another teen idol. I would say that Lord and Billy both fell in that category of being the sort of anti-teen idol because their music was different from the more frilly, upbeat teen pop. Their images juxtaposed the typical teen pop star, but that was still very much a part of their brand and meant to appeal to teens' desire to be unique. Olivia Rodrigo rose to stardom after starring on the Disney shows Bizarre Fark and High School Musical The Musical of the series. She was only 17 when she released her debut single Driver's License and 18 when she released her debut album Sour. The album was so successful, Olivia became the first female artist to have 11 songs all chart within the top 30 of the Hot 100. Olivia's music was introspective and moody, discussing her feelings on breakups, happiness, betrayal, and jealousy. Her music was also relatable to many teens and young adults experiencing their first heartbreaks. Olivia said she's inspired by other teen idols like Taylor Swift and Lord, and it's evident in her songwriting. Olivia didn't release Sour through Hollywood Records. For that reason, her music was a lot less Disney-fied and sanitized and more reflective of the reality of being a teenager. Over the last few years, at least in Western music, there's been a noticeable decline in the popularity of mainstream teen musical acts, especially major label ones. There are, and always will be, exceptions to every rule, but there is a trend when looking at lists of pop stars currently most popular in the West. Very few are currently teenagers. Most times, Olivia Rodrigo is the only teenager included, and she just turned 20. Though several of the current popular pop stars achieved fame as teens or young adults, very few still are. I've also noticed lately that when Western pop stars do rise to prominence, they're more often like 18 or 19, rather than 15 or 16, which used to be a lot more common. It's hard to determine why exactly it feels like today's teens have less musical peers to look up to, especially in the pop space. Several artists like Taylor Swift or Harry Styles still make music that their teen fan bases enjoy. But still, where are the artists making music for teens who themselves are teens? Personally, and this is my own speculation, I would assume that a lot of child performers coming forward about the trauma they endured in the industry has affected perspectives on children and teens being in the public eye. Of course, there are always going to be parents putting their kids into the entertainment industry, but people have become more openly critical of it in the recent years, and this discourse is common on social media. In some ways, it also feels like the teen idol bubble burst, at least in the West. Once making careers from social media became normalized, it almost seemed like any teen could become a celebrity. These teens weren't required to promote a family-friendly agenda or any sort of agenda and could just be themselves, which many teens found more relatable. This likely decentralized a lot of the marketing to teens and spread it across a bunch of niches that were most prominent on the internet. Surely this lessened the viability of showcasing one or a few prominent teen figures in stores and on merchandise since it was less likely that the majority of teens were fans of them. This of course still happens when the teen idol's popularity is unquestionable and transcends several niches. Recent examples I could think of are both Billie Eilish and Blackpink having clothing lines in H&M within the past couple years. A maybe negative drawback of this decentralization is also the decentralization of campaigns meant to positively impact teens. Today's influencers still spread similar messages, and while they may be similar in sentiment, the message is often less unified and less funded. With K-pop rising in global popularity, it seems many teens are gravitating to K-pop idols in the way they did with a lot of younger Western pop stars in years past. From my research, I watched a video discussing how the rise of K-pop correlated with the decline in popularity of Disney stars and similar acts. The creator discussed how the decreased popularity of Disney shows in the 2010s led to decreased interest in these stars' music careers. This decreased interest is linked with the rise of other forms of entertainment, the biggest of course being social media. Thanks to social media, teens now had access to different artists and didn't need to be told by the TV or radio what to enjoy. The internet was basically the only way for international fans to follow K-pop closely, and social media only made that easier. And once young people discovered the bright outfits, the fun choreo, and upbeat music, a lot were addicted. Similar to Western groups, K-pop idols are intentionally marketed to someone who could be a friend, boyfriend, or girlfriend. Arguably, though, these idols are pressured to portray even more perfect images than Western artists and are held to stricter expectations when it comes to interacting with fans. The creator of the video also pointed out that idols could change their concepts slightly with each comeback, giving fans more variety to look forward to. These concepts typically age somewhat with their fans as well. If a fan feels like they've aged out of a group faster than the group matures their concept, there are other groups to support with more mature content so they don't have to abandon the K-pop industry entirely. This provides incentive for K-pop companies to consistently debut new groups for teens to follow so that each generation has their own idols to grow up with. 
Disney stars don't really have the freedom to mature their image without leaving the network, and all the stars more or less are promoting the same family-friendly image. And because of this, young fans are more likely to abandon Disney as they aged. I really recommend you check out the video essay to hear in its entirety because it's really well explained and very well thought out. None of this is to say that the K-pop industry started debuting idols as teens as a reaction to the Western music industry. The average debut age has pretty much always been between 16 and 21. Of course, there are always exceptions. In the year 2000, Boa, who's known as the queen of K-pop, debuted at just 13 years old. K-pop icons Hyuna, Sunmi, Sohee, and Min all debuted between 2007 and 2008 at age 14. In 2013, Jungkook debuted with BTS at just 15 and was one of the most popular teen idols in the entire industry. However, if you're even a casual K-pop listener, you're likely aware of the alarming amount of young idols debuting in the fourth generation. When they debuted in 2021, four of IVE's six members were under 18. The youngest member was 14. Won Young, who debuted in IVE at 17, debuted in her first group, IVE's One, at age 14. Le Seraphim's youngest member, Yoon Che, also debuted at age 15. NYG's upcoming girl group, Baby Monster, appears to be aptly named. Five of the seven members are currently between the ages of 14 and 15, while one member is 17 and the eldest is 20. The youngest member just turned 14 at the end of February, and the group is planning to debut sometime this year. Blackpink, YG's latest girl group to debut, debuted in 2016 when all the members were between the ages of 19 and 21. This also doesn't mean the fourth generation is absent of idols that debuted in their later teen years or in their 20s. For example, when Espa debuted in 2020, all four members were between the ages of 18 and 20. K-pop's latest sensation, the girl group New Jeans, debuted in the summer of 2022. All five members were between the ages of 14 and 18. There was a typical concern about their age before their debut, but as it always happens, people more or less stopped caring once it became clear that their music was great. A big part of New Jeans' draw is that their concept seems to reflect teenhood in an authentic way that feels refreshing. Their styling is age-appropriate, and for the most part, with the exception of the cookie fiasco, their music is age-appropriate as well. New Jeans' concept isn't too cute to the point where it feels childish, or too mature to the point that it feels inappropriate. Their Y2K concept perfectly reflects the fashion and musical taste popular with teens and even younger adults. New Jeans is a group that was clearly manufactured to appeal to Gen Z and TikTok users, two groups in which there's typically a huge overlap. New Jeans' music has covered themes of friendship, feeling left out, crushes, which is a lot of what teens, especially teen girls, like to hear and can relate to. Currently, they hold the record for the best-selling debut album for a K-pop girl group and were the first to surpass 200,000 copies in first-day sales. In February, New Jeans also broke Blackpink's record for the most streamed girl group on Spotify, despite only having six songs currently. While it is good that tweens and teens have artists their age to represent them, the negative impacts on the performers themselves shouldn't be ignored. The younger these artists are, they're also much more vulnerable to being exploited and over-sexualized. In addition, most young teenagers aren't as equipped to handle fame, scrutiny, and hate, which their age doesn't exempt them from. They've also entered an industry, and honestly a workforce, before the age that they can understand that enough to fully consent. I and other adults have said several times that idols and honestly artists in general should start their careers a lot closer to adulthood. But I also realize that an artist's work can be more impactful when they're more of a peer to their audience, which is a potential drawback of not wanting artists to debut until they're 18 or close to it. I don't think that I can definitively say that teen idols are disappearing, at least in the Western sense, but I can say that I've recognized a decline in their prominence. I can also say that I feel like while famous teenagers obviously still exist, I think in the Western sense of a traditional teen pop idol, that concept is sort of declining or dying down. And still, that doesn't even negate the existence of artists like Billie Eilish or Olivia Rodrigo. I'm just saying that it seems like there are a lot fewer of that type of artist. You know, and I really can't imagine that the decline in marketing directly towards teens is bad for business if it really is happening. And several creators before me and other than me have pointed out that, you know, teens today, especially younger girls, just don't have a lot of options that are just teen specific in general. And I think after spending time pointing out in this video just how many billions of dollars the American teen market can spend and can generate, I think a lot of businesses have realized like, hey, like if they have this buying power and instead of trying to get them hooked on a product when they're 19 or 20, if I have them as a loyal customer from age 12, 13, 14, then they're just going to be a consumer of this product product or, or of this thing for a lot longer and that's going to translate into more profits. And so I feel like with most things this can probably be traced in some or a lot of ways back to capitalism. 
even thinking about it with music, if an artist is a lot or even just a few years older than me when I'm introduced to them, I'm a lot less likely to outgrow them or feel like their music is immature or feel embarrassed that I'm listening to someone like that. And that's not, you know, always the case because I'm 24 and I listen to a lot of artists who are younger than me. So this was, you know, a pretty nuanced and pretty abstract topic to cover, but I've seen a lot of people talking about it in the last few weeks, so it must be on people's minds. And I definitely started looking deeper into it and thinking more about it, so I had a few thoughts that I wanted to share as well. And I feel like even in this video, I kind of inadvertently raised like several different answers to this question from yes to no to maybe kind of, but the nature of the teen idol is just changing. So maybe there's just no real answer to this question right now, or as time goes, as a few more years pass, it'll be more clearer as to what the answer seems that it will be. And I mostly approached the topic from the pop music standpoint. So I'm sure that if you looked at it in the lens of television or film or even other genres of music, you might come up with a completely different answer. And I'm sure that you would, because a lot of the times these industries are interconnected, but it doesn't always mean that one trend in one industry is the same trend in another. But as always, no matter where your thoughts fall on the spectrum, I'm definitely interested in hearing what you have to say. And especially if you are a teenager or were one just a couple years ago, I would love to hear your firsthand perspective because that's going to be a lot more valuable than any research I could do or anything I could say because I'm not living through it right now. As always, thank you all so, so much for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that you can stick around for more. Also, make sure you follow me on Twitter if you'd like to keep up with me there. If you'd like to become a channel member, you can click the link in the description of this video or the join button on my channel. See you dolls very, very soon. Bye-bye.